2025. Then these are the men that have able, of course, championed by the able Minister of Finance, the Honorable Semujunganda, who has been in Umrah, who I think is still there. <laughs> and uh, could you please, members, uh, come forward? Championed by the able Minister of Finance, these are the formidable brains that have been behind uh, this uh, alternative budget. Uh, please come over, members of the Shadow Cabinet. You will be given a brief opportunity to mention your name and uh, portfolio. You don't mention that, uh, some of you may be Bakungu Baka Baka, but you only mention in the portfolio uh, of <laughs> your shadow cabinet in this, in this government. <laughs> uh, the mobile mic, please. Honorable Nachimuri, we need the mobile mic. Uh, we also, you will allow me your Excellency, to also introduce to you the other strata of leadership, very, very important, uh, that are also, they also form membership of the Shadow Cabinet by virtue of their offices of leadership. They are ex-officials of this cabinet. Uh, chairs of committees and the vice chairs, could you please join us? Join us. Even you who are not chairs of those committees, but they are ex-officials, you know yourselves, the whips, whips of uh, parties, the representation is on, uh, on parliamentary, joint parliamentary bodies, like a pub. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Karim Masaba, Member of Parliament representing Industrial Division, Bale City, and uh, Shadow Minister of Tourism and Wildlife. Very good, very good. Uh, now that you have elected to clap, clap very well, clap very well. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, sir, and Leader of Opposition. I'm Seungu Joseph Gonzaga, M. Picalon County West. But uh, frankly speaking, I'm the Minister of Education. Because the other one is nowhere to be seen. So I'm doing two duties. Full Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Your Excellency, and the Leader of Opposition, guests here. My name is Ruta Maguzi Semakula. I'm a Shadow Minister of Lands, Housing, and Urban Development. Bachireke Nambo Zebeti. MP Mukono Municipality, Shadow Minister for Internal Affairs. Samuji Ibrahim, Shadow Finance Minister. Luchams David Kalwanga, CPA Representative. Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Leader of Opposition, and all Honorable Members, Good morning and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shami Malende, woman member of parliament for Kampala district and the shadow human rights minister. Your Excellency, the right honorable leader of opposition, my name is Nyakato Asnans. I represent Hoima City as a woman member of parliament and I'm the shadow minister for agriculture. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, the legitimate president of the Republic of Uganda, His Excellency Chagurani Sentamo Robert, the Right Honorable Leader of Opposition, and other leaders present. My name is Muwada Nkunyenji, Member of Parliament for Chadondo County East, and the Shadow Minister, now acting as the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Your Excellency, our Chief Guest, welcome. Right Honorable Lop, Protocol Observed, 
My name is Betty Ithonaluima. I'm the woman MP for Wakiso District. I'm also the one who is championing full devolution and decentralization in the country, or the implying I'm the shadow minister for local governments. Thank you. Mr. President, sir, I am Kanyike Ronald Evans. I represent the people of Bukoto East, Nimasaka District. And uh, I am the shadow minister for energy and mineral development. I thank you. Your Excellency, the leader of opposition, I'm Chiaga Hillary Innocent. I represent Maokota North, and I'm the shadow minister arts and culture. Your Excellency, the president, and Lop. My name is uh, Balimwezo Ronald Insuga, the member of parliament representing Nakawa East constituents in the parliament of Uganda, but I also double as the shadow minister for Kampala. Thank you. Your Excellency, my president, my leader of opposition, protocol observed, um, Christine Kaya Nachimoero. I'm Chivoga District Woman Member of Parliament, but also the Minister for Water and Environment in the Alternative Government. I thank you. Your Excellency, the President, the Leader of the Opposition, I'm Manjari Chivakutika, the Woman Member of Parliament, Jinja City, and I'm the most experienced Shadow Minister for Trade and Industries, Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency and the Leader of Opposition and colleagues, I'm Nantongo Fortunate Rose, the woman MP Chotera, and here being the alternative government, I'm the full Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Your Excellency, the Leader of Opposition, Protocol Observed, good morning. I'm Frank Kabuye. MP Cassandra South, Shadow Minister for the Youth and Children Affairs. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, President, uh, the Leader of Opposition, colleagues, um, Nyeko, Derek, the Minister for Defense and Veteran Affairs. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Lop. Achom Joanna Lobo, the woman MP for Sorority City, Minister for Microfinance and Cooperatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, the President, uh, Lop and Kao. I'm Yusuf Onsibambi, a member of Parliament of Mawakota South. I'm also the whip of FDC. Your Excellency, I'm the oldest member of the shadow cabinet, though ex officio, everything is here. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency and the Leader of Opposition. My name is Nachimuli Helen. I am the Shadow Minister for Information and Anti-Corruption. Well, I also come from the islands, the Member of Parliament for Kalangala District. I thank you. Mr. President and the Leader of the Opposition in Parliament, good morning ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joyce Bagala Ntuatua. I am the Woman Member of Parliament for Mitiana District. I am also the Deputy Chairperson of the Government Assurances and Implementation Committee of Parliament. Thank you. Your Excellence and the Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Members, my name is Gorethi Namuga. I represent the people of Maogola County, that is from Zimbabwe District. The former Minister for Science, Innovation and Technology, but now serving as the Deputy Chairperson for the Public Accounts Committee Central Government. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Rope, and everyone, I'm um, Mayanja Adan, represent people of Nakaseke Central. I'm the Deputy Chairperson of Kosase. Deputizing Honorable Medad Sekona. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, uh, the leader of opposition, my name is Patrick Insamba Oshave. I represent the people of Kassan uh, North. 
but also you appointed me to represent this country in the Pan-African Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I've heard you here because we are going to have a group photo with the, the leadership. I'm going to request uh, the high table, uh, the uh, honorable leader of the opposition and the president to, to join us here for a, a group photograph before I discharge the next uh, session. Thank you very much, members of the Fourth Estate. You are the only ones that missed out in the group photo. <laughs> I'm waiting for us to settle. And then I discharge the singular honor and the privilege of inviting and ushering in none other than the leader of the opposition to make his remarks and thereafter to usher in the President, the Honorable Robert Chagulani Sentamu, to speak to us. Mr. Rope, you are at large.
Mr. President, invited guests, honorable colleagues from NUP, from FDC, UPC, DP, JEMA, PPP, and independents, the director and staff of the office of the leader of the opposition, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and a warm welcome. Before I go further, I just want to ensure we have a learnt of the news, or at least to reiterate the same. Um, one of our comrades in the struggle, Sarah Eperu, who's been uh, part of the Forum for Democratic Change and has been part of the leadership for a while and an activist, passed on. We learned of uh, this very unfortunate incident. I'd like to request us colleagues to stand for a minute so we can observe a moment of silence in remembrance of uh, Sarah Eperu. May her soul rest in eternal peace. Ladies and gentlemen, as we undertake the process of preparing the budget for the financial year 2024-2025, we're deeply humbled by the profound trust bestowed upon us by the people of Uganda. Their confidence in our abilities as their elected representatives is not just a privilege, but also a solemn responsibility. We understand the weight of this trust that has been bestowed upon us by the people of Uganda, and it ought to serve as the guiding force propelling us forward in our unwavering commitment to ensure efficient service delivery by the government to the citizenry, accountability, and our steadfast stance against corruption and misuse of taxpayers' money. Honorable colleagues and esteemed guests, corruption remains a pervasive and insidious problem that undermines the fabric of our society. It erodes public trust in government institutions. It diverts resources away from essential services and perpetuates inequality and injustice. As leaders, it is our duty to confront corruption head on and ensure that public resources are used for the benefit of all, not for the enrichment of a few. Ladies and gentlemen, on an annual basis, we lose over 10 trillion shillings to corruption, according to figures from the Inspectorate of Government. Think about how many hospitals this money could build and equip, roads, schools, or other critical service delivery areas. There's no way this country's resource envelope will benefit the citizenry for as long as a huge portion of this money is lost to thieves at different levels in government. It is no wonder that government is proposing to increase taxes on certain commodities and services, which are going to further burden the population that is already not seeing adequate service delivery for the tax money that they pay currently. We need to save this money that is stolen by the thieves. That way we don't have to dig deeper into the pockets of the struggling citizenry. As we speak, ladies and gentlemen, traders downtown are demonstrating against high taxes. Their businesses are crumbling. They borrow money to start businesses and they struggle every step of the way. And government is tightening the news around them. We need to listen and respond to the cries of the citizens of Uganda. And we want to join the traders and all other Ugandans that are saying it's not right for us to put a chokehold on the citizenry, and yet they struggle to see service delivery at the end of the day. And yet, they see this money that they give in taxes being stolen. And that's why the traders are saying no. And we want to encourage them, as citizens of this country, to speak out. 
And so we do support their peaceful demonstration to say this is wrong, enough is enough. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with our mandate of keeping the government in check, we pledge to relentlessly expose this corruption in whichever government entity it exists, and regardless of who is involved in this corruption. The opposition has chosen an approach to resource allocation that places human rights at its very core. We believe that access to basic necessities such as clean water, healthcare, education, housing, shelter, and social protection is not a luxury, but an inalienable right bestowed upon every citizen of Uganda. By prioritizing the allocation of resources towards these fundamental needs, we not only empower communities to withstand the trials they face, but also reaffirm our dedication to upholding the dignity of each and every Ugandan citizen. A review of the government's budgeting process has consistently uncovered apparent misappropriation and misallocation of resources, notably through program-based budgeting. This has reaffirmed our determination to prepare the opposition budget for the fiscal year 2024-2025. This budget is more than simply a financial plan. It illustrates our commitment to strengthening communities through effective service delivery. As your proposition, we don't simply oppose. We offer alternatives. And that's what we are doing today. That's what we are here for today. Even though these are alternatives are ignored most times. But at least we get to paint a picture to Ugandans of what ought to be done. We are telling Ugandans, if we were the ones in power currently, this is what we would do. This is how we would allocate the resource envelope. And that's important because they want to see leadership. They want to see people that have a vision for the country. That's what we are doing today. I'm sure you hear many times people who will say, those opposition people, they simply oppose. No, it's not just opposing for the sake of it. We are showing Ugandans, this is the direction we ought to take. And we'll keep doing that so that we show them that we are a serious government in waiting. Honorable colleagues and esteemed guests, the human rights-based approach that we have adopted forms the foundation of our alternative budget, demonstrating our consistent commitment to defending the basic freedoms and rights of every Ugandan citizen. We hope that by adopting this approach, the budgeting process will become an effective instrument for social justice and equitable development. Therefore, in order to ensure that no one is left behind, it is imperative that government allocates resources in a manner that promotes accountability and transparency. That's something that we are pushing for and will keep pushing and will not stop. There are voices that might try to silence us, but it's our duty to make sure that government is accountable, to make sure that every penny of tax money that is paid by Ugandan citizens is put to proper use. Honorable colleagues, at the heart of our responsibilities as elected representatives lies a profound duty to hold the government accountable and ensure that the allocation and utilization of resources are in alignment with the genuine needs and aspirations of the citizenry. We've got to prioritize. Sometimes it looks like government has got its priorities the wrong side up in the way they allocate resources. We want to show them the priority areas that we need to focus on, that healthcare is important, that education is important. If we want to secure the future of Ugandans, we must begin with the young people today who are in school. Just look at the pennies that are allocated to UPE, and you'll see how there is no prioritization. How do you secure the future of young people who are studying under trees? who have one teacher teaching all subjects in a class, young people who are writing on the floor and we think we are securing their future. No, we are not. We are robbing their future. How do you tell young mothers who are giving birth on the floor in hospitals across the country, including here in the city center? See the congestion in hospitals. People go to hospital and there's no doctor to attend to them. 
where a doctor is present, they don't have equipment to use. And you tell those people, those young mothers that you're securing their future, no, you're not. We are robbing their future. And we must talk about these issues. We must bring them to the fore as your position and say these must be taken care of. Government prides itself in focusing on infrastructure. Is that true? I don't think so. Of recent, you saw the outcry about the situation of roads here in Kampala, the heart of the country, the face of the country, which generates over 60% of our country's budget. And it is in such a shambolic state. It's not okay. And so we must speak out, we must give direction, and we must rally the people of Uganda to join this cause. This cause, ladies and gentlemen, is not just for us, the elected leaders. Of course, we must lead. And that's why the people of Uganda entrusted you and I to lead them, to speak for them, to be their voice. And as we do that, we should rally them to say, please join us in this cause. And I want to appreciate the people of Uganda because they are waking up and smelling the coffee. As I've told you, traders are demonstrating as we speak. Because they are saying, no, we must speak out. So that's important. As we speak all the English we can on the floor of parliament, and we shall speak that English, we must rally the people of Uganda to say, all of us should be able to speak out. Because no one is safe in a sinking boat. So it is our duty, all of us, as the people of Uganda, to see that we bring to an end this entire mess that we grapple with as a country. This duty goes beyond mere oversight. It is a sincere commitment to upholding the principles of good governance and ensuring that every Ugandan benefits equitably from the wealth of our nation. Our duty to keep the government in check is not simply a matter of political rivalry. It is a fundamental aspect of our democratic system, ladies and gentlemen. It is through oversight and scrutiny that we ensure that power is exercised responsibly and that the voices of the marginalized people are heard and represented. As we engage in this process of budgetary deliberations, let us remain steadfast in our commitment to upholding the principles of good governance. Let us ensure that every shilling of public funds is utilized effectively and efficiently to address the pressing needs of our nation. And let us never forget that our duty is not just to our constituents, but to the collective well-being of all Ugandans. And that's why we are national leaders. The people of Nakawa West sent me to parliament, but I don't represent just the people of Nakawa West. The laws that we pass, the issues we deliberate on affect everybody, and it's important that we view ourselves that way so that the people of Uganda see themselves in us, they hear their voice in our voices. Ladies and gentlemen, as we present our alternative budget to the nation, we reaffirm our commitment to fulfilling our oversight function on budget performance. We shall continue to hold the government accountable and ensure transparency in the allocation and utilization of resources, all in service of the people of Uganda. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the members of the Shadow Cabinet and the dedicated staff of the Office of the Leader of the Opposition for their tireless efforts in drafting this alternative budget. There are challenges, and we'll continue to grapple with challenges. The staff has shrinked, we have fewer people, but they're dedicated, and, and we'll keep moving because we have got work to do. The people of Uganda don't expect excuses from us. They expect us to deliver on our mandate. The expertise of this team, the Shadow Cabinet and the staff that we do have and their commitment have been indispensable in shaping our vision for a more just and resilient Uganda. I'd like to appreciate you all for making the time to be here today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for God and my country. Um, as I do end, um, I'm going to invite my leader, uh, Baran, to take note um, of our guests that have joined us today from civil society, 
civil society plays a very critical role and it's important that we all keep joining hands as i have said the struggle we are involved in to see a better country is for all of us it is for leaders it is for civil society it is for ordinary folks out there it is for the traders it is for the ordinary people everybody and so we do appreciate you i will be taking note of uh, each one by name um our shadow minister for information at some point will take note of each one of them but we do appreciate you for coming um ladies and gentlemen do allow me to invite uh, our ob he's not only a leader but uh, he's an ob in this building as we were walking down the stairs he was reminiscing about his times in this building especially during the Tojuk water call and so we kept talking a lot about that um he he will not be with us um entirely in fact i grabbed him from an engagement he was at and so shortly after his remarks he'll be going back to that engagement but i'm glad he could make time ladies and gentlemen the honorable chagura center robert you're welcome sir Mic check one, two. Uh, the Right Honorable Leader of our Parliamentary Front, uh, Honorable Members of Parliament, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, allow me also add my voice to send heartfelt condolences to friends, families and comrades of Sarah Eperu, and I continue to pray that the Almighty rests a gentle soul in eternal peace. It is an honor today for me to share my thoughts with you this morning as we launch uh, our alternative budget policies for the new financial year. The theme for today is a reflection of our vision for a new Uganda, a Uganda whose resources are exploited for the benefit of the citizens and not for the benefit of a select few individuals. A Uganda that protects and, prote and promotes dignity and basic freedoms and rights for every citizen. A Uganda that puts interests of the people, the citizens, at the forefront of public policy. The alternative budget priorities presented today recognize the plight of the ordinary Ugandan whom the leaders derive their mandate from, and also paint a clear picture of what we intend to do in order to make Uganda a country that works for every Ugandan. Ladies and gentlemen, Ugandans deserve better health care, they deserve better education, and they deserve better infrastructure in order for them to live their full potential and benefit and enjoy all their fundamental rights. Because education is essential for producing skilled workers, a workforce that will transform communities, it's therefore important that our children study subjects and courses that are relevant to their passion and natural abilities. We cannot achieve without changing, we can't achieve this without changing or in fact overhauling our entire education system and realigning our education institutions. Considering that 75% of Uganda's disease burden is preventable, then we must make our priority to invest in disease prevention rather than disease cure. This should be done in addition to hiring skilled and professional health workers through a fair recruitment process and go ahead to remunerate them fairly and on time. We must think about our creative area. 
think about our creatives, provide conditions that don't only protect their intellectual property, but also create conditions that help them to live to their full potential. About the creatives, I could go on and on and on, but the rest, I guess, Dr. Hilderman and uh, others who are creatives and within our leadership will elucidate on that. However, ladies and gentlemen, as attractive as all these alternative policies might be, it is actually impossible to achieve them if the leaders in charge of our national resources cannot rise above their petty selfishness. We must resist, we must reject, in fact, we must eject all forms of corruption in public administration, otherwise all this will be going to a waste. Our sources will continue sinking down the long drain of personal greed at the expense of our collective well-being and at the lives of our people, our children, and our children's children. As a national unity platform, we shall continue to take decisive action in that regard. Friends, many good proposals have been presented in terms of policy alternatives, in terms of laws, by ourselves and other leaders. But let us be honest, no matter how good our thoughts are, no matter how beautiful our proposals are, they shall never see the light of the day for as long as dictator Museveni is still in charge of this country. That is my firm belief. Yes, we must continue telling Ugandans the truth as it is instead of, you know, misleading them with eloquent speeches. We must paint to them a picture of the problem and he need go ahead and point at where the problem is. The man who has ruled our country for almost 40 years now is not just a political opponent to us, no. He is the embodiment of Uganda's problems. He's a living testament of corruption. He's the testament of oppression. He is the embodiment of the abuse of all democratic principles. In a nutshell, he is the roadblock, he is the stumbling block between Uganda and its progress. So let us face the reality and deal with the reality as it is. It's until you diagnose the problem that you'll be able to deal with that problem. I mean, he and his cronies live in extreme luxury while our hospitals are sick and our schools are rotting away. Yes, we have alternative policies. Yes, we have brilliant minds here in Parliament. You know, wonderful at economics, wonderful at debating and all that. But we shall debate, we shall propose, and we shall articulate issues. But let me be clear to you once again, my brothers and sisters, that no matter how good our alternatives are, no matter how well-intentioned you, our MPs, are, it won't make any difference for as long as we don't have any power to implement those good ideas. We must get used to that fact and deal with that fact exactly the way it is. I mean, we can draft the most comprehensive budgets, we can allocate funds meticulously, we can strategize endlessly, but as long as Museveni remains at the helm, the efforts will all be like rearranging cups on a falling table. We must channel all our energy. We must channel all our passion and all our abilities and all our determination towards one singular mission, removing the dictator and reorganizing the country as the citizens of Uganda. That is the only way this is going to be possible. So I continue to encourage all of us here present and those watching us outside that we must do what we must do. You cannot take a step unless you unlock your feet. So for now, what we have as a great resource is our collective determination 
and collective will to have a free country and after having that then we shall go ahead to build a Uganda where all Ugandans are equal regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of where they come from, regardless of religion, tribe or social class. We shall go ahead to build a Uganda where leaders lead with integrity, where leaders are true servants and citizens are the true masters of their destiny. So let us use this resource that we have to put an end to this dictatorship. Let us use this resource to change this country once and for all. I thank you for listening to me, for God and my country. Thank you, Mr. President, for that very elaborate speech. We also thank the leader of opposition for his speech to us all. We believe we have taken in what we have been told. Now, allow me, honorable members, to invite Coach Bob to take us through a small session of you know, stretching so we can move forward. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Coach Bob. The lope will see off the president, but as we continue. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for giving us your time. Honorable members, just a few minutes, we are going to go into the other section of the budget presentation. Our theme, Honorable Members, just a moment. Honorable members, um, we, have, we are all privy to the, we are very privy to the reason as to why we are here. It is the budget presentation for the financial year 2024-2025 and our theme as mentioned earlier is fostering resilient communities by combating corruption and promoting efficient service delivery and a human rights best approach to resource allocation so the budget that is going to be read to us for this year shall encompass all these it is a human rights best approach and uh, it will be involving all the communities everybody is supposed to be involved that means it is uh, people centered so honorable members in whatever we do especially in our constituencies let's make sure everyone is served equally allow me also take this opportunity to welcome the new members of parliament who joined us in the opposition Honorable, the Honorable Member of Parliament who replaced the last Cecilia Ogual, Imat. Honorable Rose, you're welcome. Woman M. Pit Dokolo. Yes, she is UPC. She's called Doc, Honorable Adong Janet Rose. Huh? Sorry, my apologies. Honorable, okay. Honorable, please come and introduce yourself. And we also need to see you properly because we haven't seen you well. Honorable Sarah, you're welcome. My apologies, I read a different name. That is Honorable Sarah, very beautiful. You can clap for her as she makes her way here. My greetings to everyone in the house, all protocol observed. My name is Sarah. Aguti representing Dokolo district. I thank you. Then we also have another member of parliament who joined us. I think she's Dr. Pio. Please come and introduce yourself. You're welcome, Honorable. She's also UPC. We welcome you to the Parliament of Uganda.
Good morning, uh, greetings from Oyam North. My name is Eunice Otoko Apio, the Member of Parliament uh, representing Oyam North. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. I think you've heard the voice. It is so parliamentary. Eh? I don't know, Honorable Nsamba, your voice, is it parliamentary or? You're not sure. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> Thank you so much, the honorable members who joined us. Please feel at home. I am from the National Unity Platform, but we are all, we will come everybody the way we are because we are all opposition, we are in one family. And uh, I want to ask all honorable members, being in opposition does not mean we have to oppose each other. We may have divergent issues or matters, but we, it is okay to agree to disagree. But let us focus on the goal we have as members of parliament on the opposition, such that we draw closer to where we want to go. And that is in leadership of this country. So whatever is happening or has happened before, let us put aside our differences and carry on with why we are here. We are here to make sure we serve our people diligently and uh, without isolation. Those are some of our core values. Service above self. Um, honorable members, we are going into the last segment of the day. That is a presentation of the budget, but the leader of opposition will take this on. I, I request you give me just a minute to get him and we, we get started. Thank you. Honorable Nsanja, you can now talk. It is okay. Just one minute. Uganda, 
And the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Joel B. Senyonyi, Nakawa West, Kampala City. I thank you. So in Parliament, we'll do the best that uh, we possibly can, and we shall. I want to give you my commitment, uh, because the law is clear. Rule 14.1 of our Rules of Procedure provides that the cardinal role of the leader of the opposition is to keep government in check. Honorable Speaker, in um, the last about three weeks, the people of Uganda have been raising several questions about this people-centered parliament. Questions about how we use or even misuse the people's taxpayer money. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from that quick break. Um, yes, there's a presentation there with uh, my name. I'd ask that we make some alterations, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to invite our shadow finance minister, who is going to present to us our alternative priorities. I should be doing this, but uh, it's important that as leaders we operate together because we do have our finance minister, who is very able and uh, is going to make that presentation, so we should have edited that, but that's okay. Honorable Semujunganda, our Shadow Finance Minister, kindly do come and take us through our specific alternatives.
the leader of the opposition, my colleagues in the shadow cabinet, honorable members of parliament, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I was told by a medical personnel that everybody at 40 is a candidate for another set of eyes. Now you can imagine someone of 80 plus. Um, the leader of the opposition, on whose behalf I make this presentation, will and has distributed um, a huge booklet which I've been advised will be launched at the end of this presentation that sets out our priorities. I have done a summary which I now want to present to you. This summary will not go into the details um, sector or program by program, but it will capture the significant issues in the economy and what we need to do as a country. Budgeting is the best period to judge the progress the country is making. This progress must not be measured only against impressive figures of economic growth but on how these figures have positively impacted people's lives. For example, Minister of Finance has told us that the economy grew by 5.2% last financial year, as compared to 4.6% of the previous financial year. And the target in the medium term is 7%. You need to note that while the country has maintained decent figures of economic growth, unemployment and poverty levels have remained high. The Uganda National Household Survey of 2019-2020 put poverty levels in the country at 20.3%. And a multidimensional report released by Uganda Bureau of Statistics which studies deprivation, put dimensional poverty in the country at 42.1%. Unemployment, according to Minister of Finance, has increased from 88.8 to 8.8 in 2019 to 12% in 2021. That's why Uganda is ranked country 159 out of 193 countries by the United Nations Human Development Index report, the latest one, because human development is measured mainly against progress in education and health. Public debt is our number one challenge as a country. The public debt has reached 97.4 trillion which is 52% of the country's GDP. It had hit 53.7% at some point in 2022-2023, according to the Auditor General. The International Monetary Fund argues poor countries not to contract debt above 50% of their GDP. It is unsustainable, because GDP simply means the value of goods and services you are producing. So if you are unable to get money from the goods and services you are producing to pay your debt, it means you are in a crisis. And that could be the reason the Minister of Finance, if you read their documents, are trying to revise the debt figures. They put them at 86.7, which is 46.9 of GDP, to make it look sustainable. Finance claims public debt declined from 48.4 to 46.9 last financial year. Next financial year, ladies and gentlemen, you need to take note that 
government has allocated 20.6 trillion of which interest payment is 7.6 trillion and 13 is payment of principal. 20 trillion in a budget initially it was 52 now they are fidgeting with it 54 58 but 20 trillion of that budget is debt servicing and 7.6 is interest payment that means that debt servicing will consume 38.4 of our total budget this financial year last financial year we spent 16.5 trillion on servicing the debt which has now grown by 5.517 trillion Minister of Finance has, after deducting all obligations, presented to Parliament 21.7 trillion as the available discretionary resources for the next financial year. This is the money that Parliament can reprioritize. You need to take note that uh, what they are presenting actually is it's not as much as they, they presented because they are not reducing 7.5 in wages and salaries, 316 billion in gratuity, and 263 in the pension. When all this is reduced, the resources for parliament to prioritize next financial year will be 13.6 trillion. That is the budget that government has presented. But you will see the minister with a huge bag, and he will say, I have brought a, a budget of 54 trillion, when actually the budget is 13. When you remove the wages, you remove the debt servicing, you remove gratuity, you remove pension, all that you remain with is 13 trillion. That's what debt servicing has done to our economy. In a space of one year, it has grown by an additional 5.5, .5, as I said earlier. In fact, the NRM should have chosen budgeting for debt servicing as their theme. The Water General notes on page 43 of his report that 25% of taxes collected are spent on interest payment and 10% of our taxes goes towards in, uh, payment of the principal. I am now on external debt. While in principle, we are not opposed to borrowing to finance the country's development agenda. We reject mortgaging the country through reckless borrowing. Reckless borrowing is eroding our sovereignty as a nation. It is also imposing a huge burden on our children and grandchildren because some of the debts will mature when we are either dead or are no longer in service. Uganda's external debt stock according to Auditor General, is 52 trillion. Our annual external debt servicing has reached 3.2 trillion, of which 19 trillion is interest, the money that we are paying to our foreign lenders. 1.9 every year is interest. About 12 trillion, which is 23% of this, is from China. That money, unfortunately, including money from China, includes commitment fees on undisbursed, you can use the ordinary English, on unutilized loans. We will therefore be paying 8.8 .8 billion per day next financial year in foreign debt servicing. We will be paying 8.8 .8 billion per day next financial year in foreign debt servicing. So I want to break these figures. So every day, we will be paying 8.8 .8 billion every day in servicing money that we have borrowed from many lenders, including China. Of the, and, and that is just interest. Of this, 5.5 billion will be interest. No, 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 so the 8.8 .8 is the total sum we'll be paying every day 
to our foreign lenders, 5.3 billion every day will be interest payment. 5.3 billion every day. You can count 24 hours. 8.8 .8 will now have gone to foreign lenders in debt servicing. And I want to look at Chinese loans. China alone as a country is collecting 1.1 billion from Uganda daily in debt payment, of which 358 million is interest daily. So you can count 24 hours, and China has taken 1.1 billion from Uganda, of which 358 is interest every day. Annually, China is collecting about 412 billion in debt service, of which 130, 130 billion is interest. I started with the debt, this is Annie. As of December 2022, China, through her Exim Bank, had extended loans worth over 3.4 billion, approximately 12 trillion to Uganda in the last 10 years. China accounts for 75% of our bilateral debt stock and 23% of our total foreign debt. China, according to the report on public debt, holds the largest share of undisbursed debt stock at 29%. The country is paying 434 billion in commitment fees for unutilized loans. We are paying 400. 43 billion in commitment fees for unutilized loans. A bulk of this money, 124 billion, which is 29 percent, is paid to China, as earlier noted. And you know, Chinese loans are expensive. We contract them at 2 percent, compared, say, to IMF and World Bank. Uh, I have been unable to provide the the list here of Chinese loans that we have contracted, but we can, uh, we can, can provide to you for science and technology, roads and so on and so forth, the power dams. So this list we will distribute after. And I want to go to domestic debt. According to the Auditor General, domestic debt has reached 44.6 trillion. This is mainly the money government borrows through sale of bonds and treasury bills. Next financial year, we are required to service interest on this domestic debt to the tune of 5.6 trillion. There are bonds and bills that will mature, and because we don't have money to clear them, we will run to the nearest bank to borrow 9.5 trillion to service this domestic debt. This is what economists at the Ministry of Finance call domestic refinancing, debt rollover. This 9.5 trillion debt rollover and 5.6 trillion interest brings the total domestic debt servicing to 15.1. So we require 15.1 to service domestic debt. And please take note of the following. Even what government calls domestic debt. Actually, it's not domestic debt. Why? Our financial sector in Uganda is dominated by foreign players. We have 25 licensed commercial banks, only four are local banks. So even the government tells you that we have gone to borrow locally, they go to Stambik, which is not owned by Uganda. That's why all the interest will go away. But they will have told you, no, 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 this is foreign borrowing, this is domestic. Actually, it's not domestic. The list of the banks is also provided. We can share 25 licensed banks, only four are local. And then we keep borrowing from these banks and tell the country that this is domestic borrowing. Actually, it is also foreign. You need also to take a note the points that the leader of opposition earlier made. Because if you borrow from foreign lenders, and I've given the figures every year, and even what you call domestic borrowing, you go to the same lenders, but they, are, they only have branches here. They take 20 trillion every year is paid to service debt to banks that are foreign owned here and banks from foreign countries. And then you go sector by sector. You look at the telecom sector. 
the key players are foreign. All the money they get is repatriated. You go to the energy sector. Even after disbanding the Uganda Electricity UEB, we went and brought in foreign companies to run our energy sector. So Meme is taking money, Stambik is taking money, then you go to borrow from China, and then you don't have to be an expert to know why poverty levels are rising and why the levels of unemployment are rising. And most important to note is that we borrow money and don't utilize it. And then we pay exorbitant fees. So the total of undisbanded loans now is at 18.7 trillion. So this money we have uh, filled the forms, they have given it to us, it is available. But we are not utilizing it. So the requirement is that we'll keep paying fees and we keep paying the fees, but the money is not utilized. The Water General Court's lower figure of undisbursed loans at 14.5. As I said earlier, we are paying 400 34 billion annually in commitment fees on money we are not using. The reason we delay to utilize loans is because of undesigned projects. So they are Procurement is done at a, a nail speed and the right of way is not obtained before we go to banks to borrow money. We have segmented because the point we make of the resilient communities, look, in agriculture we borrowed money. 309 billion borrowed to boost agriculture is unutilized. And uh, we provide the table here for you to see. We borrowed money for digital transformation. It is also not utilized. We borrowed money to fix our broken road network to the tune of 13.2 trillion. It is still there, not utilized. There are road projects such as upgrading the well of Tarangu, for which we borrowed 44 billion from OPEC in 2018. You can imagine we borrowed 2018 to upgrade this road, but the money is there. We acquired 895 loan from the African Movement Bank for the construction of Kampala Jinja Expressway. That money is also there. Government is looking for money to pay for, for, for passage. So the money for roads, even before you begin the allocating what is available, even if you are using just the money that you have borrowed, 13.2 trillion and the roads that are affected a list is here it will be provided the same applies to the health sector where we have borrowed money to fix our health infrastructure but this money is also not utilized it goes to innovation technology and development transfer in the manufacturing sector, 276. In public sector, 43 billion. Regional development, 109. I am giving you figures of money borrowed for these sectors or for programs that is not utilized. In the energy sector, we have borrowed up to 3.3 trillion. We have used only 2.3 trillion. And a list per sector is provided, which we'll be sharing. I have now moved to domestic areas. The total stock of central government area, according to finance, rose from 4.8 trillion 2020-2021 to 
7.9 trillion in 2022. So the Finance presents a figure of 7.9 trillion as our domestic area. The Auditor General presents a figure of 10.8 trillion. And this is money owed to people who have supplied the government in various categories, including court awards, taxes, pension, ETC, rent. What is worrying is that uh, government is only providing 200 towards clearing domestic area. So government uh, owes its suppliers 10 trillion, but in the budget they are providing 200 billion. So it will, it will take them maybe my remaining entire life because I am 50. I don't think I will reach 100 for this government to clear this debt when they are not contracting a new one. I now move to abuse, as noted earlier by the leader of the opposition, abuse of borrowed money. You may all have interacted with the report of the Auditor General. The Auditor General reports on page 84 that we, we have vaccines for COVID worth 300 billion that have expired. Remember the loan the last parliament contracted during the COVID period from World Bank and IMF. 300 billion was used to buy vaccines. Now these vaccines have expired worth 300 billion. There are other drugs at national medical stores worth 33 billion that are also expiring. Interesting. The Minister of Health now says they are going to use money, part of the money of Gavi to go and destroy the, these vaccines. So you have borrowed the money, vaccines have expired. Now the money brought here by donors to deal with other problems is what you are going to use to, to go and destroy the expired vaccines. I am reading all this list that will bring me to a figure because we need to clean the budget. Our proposal is that this budget must be clean. One of the figures that you will find in the budget, aggregated figure, this government is spending 187 billion on renting offices every year. 187. Even if you are not a contractor and they give you 187 billion every year, you can construct offices for someone. But maybe these buildings are theirs. 187 billion is what is being provided in the budget for rent. And we have provided a figure. Can you imagine you go to France and you rent for embassy 3.9 a year? In five years, anyone, even of average understanding, will use the 3.9 per year to construct. But we are spending, and the whole list is provided here, what we are spending on embassies, what we are spending on buildings, including later on, I will be showing you, we are also renting uh, some structures for state house. Maybe the president and his wife are not fitting in uh, Nakasero and Entebbe. So they are renting extra buildings. So the list is provided here of where we are paying money for rent. Next financial year, we will spend 780 billion on transporting public officers. 780 billion. On average, that's what we spend. Because Usually we spend 220 billion acquiring new vehicles. We spend 404 billion fueling them. 155 billion on maintaining these vehicles. So in a year, we are spending 780 billion 
The leader of opposition earlier spoke about phasing out, uh, which is part of the presentation that you have, reducing on cost of public expenditure like RDCs. Because an RDC in Rubaga, the best you can do is buy him a motorcycle. <laughs> Someone is resident in Rubaga, that's where he's an RDC. You buy him a pickup of 400 and then you fuel it and maintain it and give him a drive. And all they do is to visit one radio station after another to go and uh, badmouth the opposition. And you will see a whole feed. 200 vehicles, brand new pickups for RDCs. And you all know what they do in your respective areas. Because they, we can even buy them bicycles. So the table here is showing how much you are going to spend on buying vehicles, on fueling them and maintaining them. We are also spend, we are going to spend 162 billion on donations by our leaders. And the list is provided here. Mr. M7, under his residence, he will donate 77 billion. Again, he has what he calls support presidential initiatives, 59 billion. Parliamentary Commission has 4.9 billion for communication and public affairs. Again, M7 has 4.2 billion in his office for donation. The Prime Minister has 3.7 donation. The Speaker of Parliament, 2.4 billion donation. The National Council of Sports, 2.4 billion donation. The government whip has 1.8 billion donation, not his entire budget, but he has 1.8 billion for donation. The opposition whip has zero. If the leader of opposition has nothing to donate, what about the leader of opposition? So the whole list of who has money to donate that comes to 162 billion is here. You can interact with it. We are going through this list and I'm about to come to an end. I say this is going to be a summary. Looking for money that will be reprioritized. That's why we are going through this list. Money for donation, money for vehicles, money for this. All this money can be reprioritized in the sectors that the head of opposition outlined here, health, education, sectors that are going to help our people. But before I do that, let's look at the revenue projection. We had problems with the finance when they came to Parliament. They said revenue, the projection was that it was, it was going to grow by less than 1%. Yet on average, it has been growing by, by 11%. And that's why they had maintained 29 trillion when you go to the side of um, resources to finance next year's budget. When we, main, we maintain the annual revenue growth of 11, it means we'll have 33.4 trillion and not 29. And then I want to come to other areas to complete the list of what we have identified as luxuries in the budget. That list, uh, if it can be highlighted there. Next financial year, we have 34 billion for ceremonies and state functions. 34 billion. When you see these NRM people going to a function, they have 34 billion for ceremonies and state functions. Travel inland, 
Next financial year, we have 671 billion travel inland. And travel abroad, we have 108 billion. We have 152 billion for workshops, meetings, and seminars. 297 billion special meals and drinks. We have, well, I have already read out the list of donations. We have 133 billion for welfare and entertainment. When you put this together, you will have 1.5 trillion that is available. And our proposal is that even if you reduce it by just 25%, you'll have 1.1 trillion available. I now come to our budget proposal. After doing all what I have outlined, we think the realistic budget for Uganda should be 43 trillion shilling, not any other figure. Why? If you look at the, and you need to take note of this, every year government presents a budget and I'll use last financial year, they presented a budget of 54 trillion. When it came to the actual release, they usually publish in newspapers that we have released the money. Most of the time they have released the air. Because what that release means is that they have now asked the government agencies to begin submitting invoices to finance for payment. When those invoices are submitted to finance for payment, there is no money. The most interesting thing is that uh, even when they budgeted for 54 trillion, they made release less than 5.4 trillion. By their own release, they have a budget of 54. When they publish the theoretical release, it was less by 5.4. When it came to actual money that is spent, it was actually 43 trillion. So the, the realistic money that was available that was spent was 43 trillion. But they released about 49 trillion in theory. But they did not even release the whole budget as, as they had presented it. Uh, we are doing this coming to a figure, and this will be the, the last part. The figure that has, a, if you can go there, the figure that has our budget. So we, we've made proposals on what to remove, what to reallocate these sectors. And I said we will not be going into details of what we intend to, put to reallocate and to what particular sector and department. But eventually when all this is done, um, you will come to a budget of 43 trillion shilling. When you will have removed all the luxury, and our proposal is that uh, once you've dealt with this luxury, next year you don't even have to go and borrow nine trillion uh, from commercial banks. And then if for a sustained period of three to four years you are not borrowing, it means now you'll have more resources available. You'll no longer be spending 20 trillion on servicing debt. Finally, um, I hope I have been clear because I said this is going to be a summary. The NUP president, the Honorable Chagulani, made here very substantive statement on seven being our problem, and I share it 100%. Part of the problem that we have in this budget, <clears throat> and this indiscipline is replicated elsewhere, is that the country has been made to finance Museveni's life, both public and private. I'll give you an example. 
The title first lady means someone who's wife, isn't it? And in fact, it's not even provided for in the government hierarchy. But next financial year, we are going to pay someone. His name is Waiswa Charles Baker. His job is executive assistant first lady. So for Museveni's wife to be Museveni's wife, we must recruit staff for her, including an executive. I don't know dear, how he's going to engage with two adults who are married. But his job, and he's paid four million. Because how can you be paid to be an executive secretary to an existing office? The office of first lady does not exist. But we are recruiting someone to facilitate that office that does not exist on the government's structure. And the name is there. You can look at the policy statement of the president. We also have a, a special presidential assistant on household affairs, Butajira Penelope. This person is paid the this person is paid the eight million per month to help these two adults on their household affairs. And that brings the entire list of people who work at Museveni's residence to one thousand. As you earlier interacted with it, he has a 51 cleaners, 62 cooks, he has 80 gardeners, 29 housekeepers, 10 dobby and round area tenants, 100 private secretaries, 14 room attendants, 22 presidential assistants at the residence, <clears throat> 51 waitress and waiters, and 14 presidential advisors. So these are people who are supposed to be helping our president and, and his wife because State House is provided for under the Presidential Monuments and Benefits Act as a residence of the president. <clears throat> Interestingly, and we'll be sharing these lists as well. Mr. M7 has also created another category of mobilizers and political, some of them are mobilizers, political assistants in the state house. They do Museveni's political work, but they are paid by Uganda. For example, someone mentioned Namiaro here, the one who was in Kororo abusing Muslims who went to Foftari. Her salary in the state house is 12 million per month, but she sits at Museveni's office as chairman of NRM in Chambogo. So someone who is employed by NRM in Chambogo is on the payroll as a special presidential assistant, 12 million per month. That list has nearly 200 people who are doing that sort of work, we'll be sharing it. So honorable members, the details of our locations, of our proposals, uh, in a booklet that the lead of opposition will launch. And these proposals are proposals sector by sector, program by program. What I have outlined here is a summary and the structure of the economy. So I want to thank you very much for listening to me, for God and my country. Thank you, the very able finance minister, Honorable Samuju Ibrahim Nganda, for that very elaborate presentation. And thank you for being brief. Uh, allow me, honorable members, welcome the Honorable Miriam Atembe. She has just joined us. Honorable, we welcome you. Please feel at home. She's one of the elders I talked about before. 
and we are very thankful we still have her in, in our presence. Uh, honorable members, allow me, uh, that is honorable members and our visitors, allow me once again welcome, because I welcome these members in the absence of the leader of the opposition, the new members of parliament that joined us and that they are in the opposition, Honorable Apio, that is Honorable Dr. Apio and Honorable Sarah Guti, please stand up for recognition. You're welcome once again. I would also want to welcome our, some of our guests here and allow me to mention the names. Mr. Chris Nkwatsiwe from the National NGO Forum. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. We have Mr. Aibaziwe Innocent from the Ethics and Integrity Forum. You're very much welcome. Where is he? Thank you so much for coming. And um, allow me, honorable members, at this juncture, like we said, we're not going to take a lot of time. Uh, allow me to invite the leader of the opposition to launch the finance, our budget for the financial year 2024-2025. That is all enshrined in that book that we all have. Honorable members, please go and read uh, whatever is in this book and understand, because I believe most of you are going to be invited on different TV stations, radio stations, to tell the country what it is all about. So let us understand and uh, best present the opposition of pa the Parliament of Uganda. The leader of your opposition, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Helen. We are pretty much coming to the end. I um, understand we have some representatives from the UN who have joined us. I don't know if they are in the room somewhere. Are they? Okay, well, um, we'll probably try and locate them at some point. Want to appreciate you again, colleagues, for making time and coming. I want to appreciate again the director the office of the leader of the opposition and the technical staff who, who I tend to stress, well, not stress really, but, um, you know, we keep driving them as hard as we possibly can to produce this work and they are doing an incredible job, even when it's a lean team, but we appreciate them. I want to also again welcome the Honorable Dr. Miriam Matembe, who has just joined us. She's got numerous commitments, but she has come nonetheless. As I end, I'll invite her to say hello to us in about two minutes or so. As Honorable Helen has been saying, we do produce this work. Uh, let's, let's make good use of it. Um, it will even help us to keep shaping the next ones. These are documents that we avail so we can interact with them. Um, our alternative budget priorities were captured from our alternative ministerial policy statements, which were laid in Parliament and they were brought to your committees. I hope you have been attending these uh, sectoral committees and interacting with these documents and, and so on. But again, when you get the documents, please find time and read so you can excogitate over them and we see how we keep improving them so that the next time we have even better watertight documents. This, our opposition priority areas, we did unveil it a couple of weeks back and um, were saying, this is what we want to be focusing on, critical issues, you know, corruption, poor service delivery, human rights abuses, etc., etc., to make sure that uh, we execute our mandate. We unveiled this a short while ago. There's another small document that um, we have availed to us. Herein is our budget speech. It's a summarized version of uh, our breakdown of the alternatives, what we think needs to be focused on. So we have captured it in this document. 
And finally, this big, fairly big, not too big, uh, booklet here is what has our alternative budget priorities for the different dockets. So you will find herein what we are proposing should go to healthcare, what we are proposing should go to education, to infrastructure, to all the service delivery areas. And we are showing you where the money can be gotten from. Honorable Semuju has very ably, and I want to appreciate him, made his presentation to show the wastages, to show the corruption and so on. So when we are telling government that you are allocating so little to healthcare, we are telling them this is what ought to be allocated there. This is what ought to be allocated to the different dockets. And we are also pointing out where the money can come from. Because normally, when we say allocate more to healthcare, allocate more to education, infrastructure, and so on, they say, but you see, we are a poor country. We don't have the resources. So we in the opposition are saying, we do have the resources. Let's cut down on the wastage that we have been showing you. Let's stamp out corruption. We shall have the resources to deliver services to the people of Uganda. And so ladies and gentlemen, I take the pleasure to launch this uh, booklet which has got our alternative budget priorities. Our hope is that, uh, yes, the good, amazing ideas in this booklet will be picked for the benefit of the people of Uganda. I thank you. Allow me now to invite the Honorable Dr. Miriam Matembe to say hello to us. She's also an OG of uh, this place, a former member of parliament, former ethics and integrity minister, one of the most outstanding ministers to ever occupy that docket. And since we've been talking about issues, corruption and so on, I'm sure she will have a quick message in that regard. Dr. Matembe, you're welcome to talk to us as we close. Thank you very much, Honorable. First of all, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I must apologize. You see, we senior citizens, we have so much and forgetfulness is part of it. <laughs> so I remember Friday, a lady rang me over Thursday or something and said, we want you. I said, hey, what is it? Budget? Oh, okay. I'll see. Now, since morning, uh, that was off the head. And then around 11, he said, where are you? I said, my goodness, who are you? He told me. He said, when are you finishing? He said, two o'clock. I said, okay, let me at least appear. <laughs> so I'm sorry that I came late, and so I have not had this whole thing. Uh, but I want to say that I was very happy to have been invited to, to, to come here to, to listen to what you are saying. You know, many people, me, whichever party, whoever calls me, I go, I'm a senior citizen and I'm a Uganda. It does not matter where or what, I'm a Ugandan as a senior citizen. I'm interested in Uganda as a nation and Ugandan people. So when Inup calls me, I, I come and I'm very happy to be there. I wish I was here to listen to everything and then say, oh, so this is the alternative view. I want to thank you so much to ensure that you really offer your alternative view because what is democracy? This liberal democracy, which we say we are following, is that there is this government to serve the nation and there is the opposition to give alternative view and to be watching oversight and see next year or the other year they may be now the government, while the other one is in opposition. So opposition and government are supposed to work together, all driven by service to their nation and to their people whom they serve. So for me, I, I love now what you are doing, that the budget statement was, you know, was given, I think, and then you are saying for us, if it were we, this is how we would go about it. And one of the reasons why I'm so happy about this is that it, it, dis, it, is it, what? it disputes eh? these, all these general Ugandans who say, this opposition, it has no program, it has no plan, 
It, it, that's how they talk about opposition. And usually I say, but look here. Do you think a group of people can sit there and say we want to lead this nation without this manifesto? And I'm sure every, every party has a manifesto, but because people don't read them, they think that when you come up to read, you have nothing to offer, just because we generally don't read. And I'm even wondering how many are even listening to the alternative budget. But for me, what I want to tell you is, as a leader who was a leader, elected leader, but who continues to be a leader because leadership does not end, and leadership is about service, and it does not depend on any position you hold, but it depends on the passion you have for your vision for the people you are leading. So whether 19 years ago, I have no position which I hold, but I'm still a leader in this country. And so I'm so happy that you give this and people read and hear that if it were you, you would have done this kind of thing. So I want to congratulate you that you, you move on. Whether you are discredited, whether you are bashed, I remember is it Martin Luther King or Junior who said that if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but at least continue moving. In other words, whether they discredit, whether they rubbish, whether continue moving. One day, your movement will be real. Didn't you see Barack Obama? Amazing and incredibly being the, the president of America because they continued running. So walking or crawling. So that's what I would wish to you. Now, having said that, you said I was one of those ministers. By the way, I was the first minister for ethics and integrity. 19. <laughs> I was appointed in 1998, but because of my integrity in the environment which does not want integrity, I didn't stay long. It was, I didn't finish even five years. Because I stood my integrity, I was thrown out, and thrown out completely up to now, 19. <laughs> because of my integrity. And whatever they try to say, Kaka, I say, my integrity does not allow this. And so, when you say you are fighting corruption is your priority, I say, well, that's good. But as I stand here, I stand here as a senior citizen, as a Ugandan. And I stand here to tell you, you how many, I don't know how many parliamentarians are here, that for us outside there as Ugandans, we look at you as the same. We look at parliament and say, those terrible people, they are robbing us, they are robbing us. So my challenge which I throw to you is that each of you who is there is to distinctively stand tall, distinctively stand tall and show that for you, indeed, you are opposing these corruptions, these unethical conducts, this what? Stand there distinctively showing that what drives you into that parliament is service, service to your people. Stand out distinctively like that and give this alternative budget, whether it is being implemented, whether it is taken up for you, you get guided and you follow the principles that you have put here so that everybody can say, yeah, whether they bash them or what, at least there are a few Ugandans who are standing distinctively for us. And because of them, we shall overcome. That is what I want to tell you on behalf of Ugandans. Because we really feel these people whom we chose to serve us are not driven by service. That at the center of, your, of, your, of what I call leadership, rather than being people-centered, is self-centered. 
Rather than being service-oriented, it becomes power-oriented. In other words, you find that, yes, you are in this leadership, but you are driven by self-centeredness and power-orientedness. And yet, a leader should be driven by people, should be people-centered and service-oriented. I'm so glad that I'm in a, um, I've been, I stood here as a senior citizen to tell you that kind of thing, so that you get to know that for sure, for sure, where our country has reached, it needs liberation, it needs redemption. And for us, where we are, our eyes are on God, of course, but God does not come here and work. We believe that that God can work through you and bring things to, to a better way. And so I want to thank you and I want to encourage you and, and stay tough. Have you, have you ever seen me ever shaken by anybody? Eh? 19 years. I worked for 30 years, good 30 years for this country. But when I said no, you can't remove the term limit, I was thrown like in the garbage. No pension, no gratuity, no not, nothing. I don't tell you to choose those people, but I tell you how people can rob you. Me, I was robbed. But because I stand with my God who created me, have you seen me lacking? Have you seen me? I don't have mansions, I don't have the, those who remain here. But I work, continue to serve for a legacy. That when I'm long gone, it is not the pension, it is not the what, eh? that they will remember about me. And I can assure you, it gives you joy, it gives you peace, it gives you, and so now that you've, you've enabled me to stand here, I want to affirm you that when you stand with what is right, with what is good for the people of God, because God puts in a position, the Bible says that King David knew that God had appointed, appointed him a leader in Israel for the sake of his people, Israelites. Now, if you take it that God granted you this position of leadership for the sake of Ugandan people, and you stand with that, he will stand with you and you will stand tall and he will keep you and one day he will use you to deliver this nation. Now, as I go to sit, I don't know whether you talked about this issue of taxes for Ugandans. You people, Ugandans are dying. Ugandans are suffering. I have a personal experience. I had my Kasumoro house, which has been giving me whatever little I eat and so on and so forth. But this is a house, an old one, which is no longer new. People go in the new ones. So I get Kasumoro taxi from it. But I tell you, revenue authority takes almost a uh, 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 half of it. The same rent is being taxed by revenue authority and city council. Double taxation. I went and appealed everywhere. They told me that it is you, parliament, who passed a law that resulted into that double taxation. That's what they told me. I went to Revenue Center. I went to City Council. Imagine to the judge. I appealed on behalf of Ugandans. I said, if they can torture me, what about these market women, these small rentals which people have? People are dying out there, you members of parliament. So this tax of yours now, which has increased, and it is aggressively, aggressively collected from people whom you are not giving anything to raise it. Please be human. Ugandans are doing what? Are perishing. Me, that's what I leave to you. The tax, the tax, the tax, please. Deal with it. Otherwise, people can care for themselves. You are not therapying them. But if they have their carento, if they have, don't take it without giving them anything, please. Thank you so much. 
for God and my country, I speak these words and I wish you the best and I, I pray that one day, like Jesus rose from the dead and delivered us from sin, that this country may be redeemed and delivered once again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mama, the doctor, the Honorable Dr. Miriam Atembe. I think we have all been energized by her words of wisdom, and we wish to drink from that cup always. Honorable members, like I told you before, some of us have grown up seeing these women of valor, and we would wish to be like them when we grow up, even better. So the ladies here, Brace yourselves to become the best women of this nation, not just in opposition, but in the leadership that we clamor for. Honorable members, as we close, I want to thank you so very much for attending in big numbers. And I also want to thank you for always and always coming in whenever you're invited for different uh, engagements of the opposition. The Office of the Leader of Opposition is very much gratified and we call upon you to always come, especially when you're invited for other engagements. As we conclude, I would also want to say something small. Honorable members of parliament and those in the opposition, we are a family. You know, in a family, there are three things. There are courtyard matters or compound matters. And then we have living room issues or matters. And then we also have bedroom matters. Those ones I think you're very much aware of. Honorable Nsamba, when I mentioned bedroom matters, he rose his head up, he was on his phone. So, <laughs> you know, I, I request all of us members of parliament on the opposition side, let us let us distinguish between bedroom matters, living room matters, or courtyard matters. Those matters we need to discuss out there, let us discuss. We all know that the bedroom issues should stay in the bedroom. The young ones should not know what we do in the bedroom. <laughs> I see all of you are now attentive. Thank you so much for giving me the attention. Yes, because we are all leading to, we are all looking at one, one goal. We want to get to somewhere, but if we want to get there, can we have some secrets in the opposition? Because these people who are leading us or ruling us like this, the dictators, for them they, they sit somewhere and they have their, in Luganda we call it a kasaka, can we also have that, such that we do not display all our weapons to our enemies? Honorable members, we need this to be done as a family. To whoever is concerned, the civil society, wherever you can come in, please, we request you come in to help the opposition to get into power because we have the best alternatives as we have laid here before. Honorable members, I thank you. And I also leave you with Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is time for everything. Everyone here, you have your time. There is time to shine. We are shining now, but we are not shining the way we want. We need to shine when we are in leadership, at the top leadership position. I want to thank you all. Thank you for coming. I pray that the Almighty God takes you back home safely and to your constituents, serve them well. I pray we... Go back safely. Let, let's rise for the national anthems and we go. Thank you so much, honorable members. Let's have the national anthem.
Thank you so much, honorable members. Last reminder, there is an outbreak of red eyes. Honorable members, beware. Yes, beware, please.
Come on. 